Number 304. 304. <clears throat>
fall fresh on me. Not a one of us has made it. Not a one of us is infallible. Not a one of us is immune to the wiles of the enemy. Not a one of us can't be beat down if we're not careful. Praise Spirit of God, fall fresh on us today. Praise we need help. Yes. We need help. Our country's in a mess. Our neighbors are in a mess. The enemy's up and down the land like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And we're all pray that he just keeps trying. But we've got, we can have victory, no yeah. doubt. We've got to have his spirit continually by our side. This morning, as we look to the Lord in prayer, we're thankful that David is back. It's been a long time that you've come on your own volition and driven yourself. And so, from the hospital bed, totally out of it, to driving, I would say God has been good to you, David. Praise God. Praise God. He's going to see your prayer, let you see your prayers answered, I believe. To where your pew is full of your friends and family. Amen. And it's good to have the new and swanders with us, our friends from Oklahoma City most of the time and Bradleyville a little time. And so they've wanted to come and they're part of the reason we've started recording these services is they go to Oklahoma City and Virgil and Linda have church with us after the fact. So those are things we're thankful for. Are there other things we need to praise the Lord for this morning before we take requests to him? Um, the Lord answered prayer for us this week. Um, I was at work and my client got a new medication and it was granules and it was it's difficult to get those granules through the feeding tube and I used too big of a syringe and got the feeding tube plugged. I called Johnny and I said pray now and uh, her, her feeding tube is plugged up and Johnny takes me just right back in just a little bit and said God's going to take care of it and we got that feeding tube unplugged. Wow. And I just thank the Lord. A very present help in time of trouble. If we hadn't got it unplugged, we would have had to take her to the hospital and had a surgical procedure because she has a special type of feeding tube that has to be surgically in inserted. And so um, it, it was just a wonderful thing that God did for us this week. Wow. Any other answers to prayer? Well, we've got answers to prayer. What do we need to pray for today? I have a, I have an appointment Wednesday, and I don't know whether you pray for that, do you? <laughs> Johnny's Wednesday appointment. <clears throat> I have two cousins that are sisters. They both were in the hospitals at Joplin in different hospitals. One of them was involved in a wreck, and she had the bleeding on her brain up on the 8th of this month. Still there yet. The other one has is having kidney failure. She has gone home, but the doctor's uh, pretty certain that she, she has cancer. I'll find out next week. My sister Lila is um, having problems. She doesn't know what they're going to do about it yet. Um, from her um, previous surgery, she's having some pain that they said shouldn't be there. Right. Most everybody here knows Mary Preston. She's been diagnosed with cancer and uh, she will be having surgery and hopefully it's not in the lymph nodes because she cannot have chemo. She has rheumatoid arthritis and uh, the medications that she's on, she, the doctor says they can't do chemo. Okay. Boy, our, whist, our lists 
keep looking weighty, but God is still on the throne. Praise God. So let's stand this morning and we'll look to the Lord in prayer. They in my car. <coughs> That's they are, I think, at Cherokee. Is that where oh, yeah. Max um, yeah. has a church? I think that's where they are this morning. So they should be well, at least when I talked to him last. <laughs> Father, we come before you today thankful. Thank you, Father, that at the crystal fountain, Lord, we found the needs that satisfied our heart. We're thankful, Lord, that you can fill us with your spirit. Thankful, Lord, that in the dark of the midnight have we oft heard your cry. And as the storm comes around us, as Dee said this week, there was a problem and Johnny got through and then the answer came. And Lord, we're thankful today that you answer prayer. We're thankful, Father, that you're a very present help in time of trouble. We thank you, Father, that you have met with us time and time again, Lord. We're thankful that your presence is here this morning. You're going to help us, we believe. We're going to open your word and you're going to help us. We thank Thank you, Father, that David can be here, Lord. We're thankful that you raised him up. We're thankful that we can have confidence and boldness to come before the throne on behalf of his needs and his requests and his family. We're thankful, God, that you hear and you will answer prayer. We're not giving up. We're not going to discount the fact that we haven't seen answers, but we're going to keep pressing through and pressing through and pressing through until we see the results of our faith. And it no longer has to be faith, but we've seen the answer. Sir. We pray, oh God, for the furtherance of this service. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Johnny's appointment Wednesday, Lord. You know what it is. I don't totally know, but you know what it is. And Lord, you can help there, whatever that circumstance is. We pray today, Lord, for Jack's cousins, the one that has a brain bleed and the one that might have cancer, Lord. We pray that you would be with them. We pray that you would get comfort and help and, and uh, be an alongside helper as you've promised you would be. We pray today for Lila, Lord, and her colon problems. We pray that you would touch her and help her and be close to to her. We pray today for Mary Preston, Lord. We don't know the circumstance of her uh, cancer, but you do, Lord. And we're trusting you to help and intercede in a way that whatever we needed, you'll provide and you'll do. We pray, oh God, for the ones that drive up and down this road, Lord. We're still trusting you for a family to come in off the street, a mother and a dad and a bunch of children, Lord. We're trusting you to send them. And then, oh God, as we start looking toward the summer and we look toward a vacation Bible school and we look look out across our crowd and we don't see many children Lord but we know there's lots of them and you said suffer the little children to come unto me and so oh God we're praying that you would somehow give us a desire and a longing and a hunger and a willingness to put ourselves out to do what it takes to reach the lost in our present age we pray oh God that you would undertake and move upon us send us a spirit of revival in this place a willingness to work for Jesus because you've done so much for us we pray oh God for uh, the churches across our land today where men and women are standing in pulpits and preaching your truth and people are listening. We pray, oh God, for revival in our nation. We thank you for the peace you've given us and the prosperity you've given us. But oh God, we need a spirit of revival. We need a spirit to fall fresh on us. Our nation molded and melted and filled with your likeness. We pray, oh God, for your help. Oh, Jesus, we're so happy today that you loved us and sent your son for us. And we want to be like you. Help, we pray, in the furtherance of this service. And we'll give you thanks and praise because you're very worthy of it. Amen. Number 578. 578. <laughs> Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures, feed us. For our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us Thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us Thine we are. We are Thine, do Thou befriend. Guardian 
lifelock from sin defend us. Seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, in the soul of Blessed Jesus, to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early testimony this morning they'd like to share. No, I'm really truly thankful for the Lord today. You know, it's been amazing when he's been telling me. You know, I feel like he's a huge thing lately because, you know, I haven't had any major potential problems with me. But I am so thankful that the Lord touched me. You know, I'm Judas Smith, no matter what it's ahead of me, I know that as long as God's in my heart that I can handle it. I can be in precious faith. Thank you, Johnny. <clears throat> feel like a human being again it, it would have to wear on a man to constantly be in pain and then to have deliverance praise the Lord praise Brother Virgil Anyone else this morning need to testify? Well, I'm thankful for what God has done for me, the way He has helped us and supplied our needs, been with us. Thank you. Bless that you. He saved me, sanctified me. Bless you. I want to make it to heaven. Praise God. Thank you, Jack. I'm glad to be here this morning. 
I wouldn't know what it would have been like to not be here, but I believe I would have been rejoicing and where I would have been. But folks, I tell you, God is so good, so great, and so mighty. There's nothing that my, my God cannot do. I think about all these people that are waiting to the last minute. They don't know when the last minute's going to come. I think of people saying, well, I, I want to get saved, but yet they don't, they, they don't ever act like it. You tell them they're going to hell or you mention hell and they're scared to death of it. But they, they just can't feel themselves going to hell, but they don't want to do nothing about their soul. I don't understand that myself personally. But, uh, you know, they're going to wait for some, some kind of a, for God to slap them down or whatever. I can tell you for a fact, you could be going down the road. You can be sitting in a restaurant. You can be anywhere you want to be. And the next minute you're dead. Just as dead as you'll ever be. And I'll tell you folks, I would have not, I would have not known that everybody else would have known the difference, but not me. I didn't care. When you got your prayer done, your forgiveness is asked. And you're looking for that, looking for that new Jerusalem. Folks, everything else takes second best. I love him this morning with all my heart. And I think, you know, if I had to had everything taken care of, if they hadn't have brought me back, I'd have been in hell this morning. People don't want to talk about hell, but folks, it's, it's real. It's as real as anything else is. And if they don't make preparations to go to heaven, that's where they're going to end up, no matter how good or how great a person they are. God he can talk to people and they just shrug it off. They just take it. One of these days they're going to have to ask God's forgiveness for those things that they shrugged off and don't want to run their own life and want to run their own thoughts and all this. It just, uh, it worries me when I see people that, you know, God can deal with them and they'll skirt around it somewhere or another try to get it off their mind, and yet God has been faithful to deal with souls. And they don't have any idea. I, when I went in and sat down at that restaurant, I had no idea in the world that I'd be dead in just a few minutes. Folks, we gotta take life serious. We're gonna go someplace. And folks, I wanna see every one of you in heaven. I loved him this morning with all my heart. When we hear stuff like that, it, it takes the it takes the frill, the fluff, off, and we realize that when it's all said and done, more probably will be said than done. But we don't spend enough time dealing with people. If we really believed hell is as bad as it is and heaven's as good as we profess, we'd be doing more. I'd be doing more. We talk a big talk and walk a little walk. And I'm as guilty as anybody. Is anyone else? I have something that I want to read this morning. Uh, my Uncle Jimmy died Wednesday of this week, and right, my sister had been here, and then she went to Kansas City, and then went on, to buy, went on by to see Uncle Jimmy, and it wasn't very many days at all till, till he was gone. But I'm going to tell you what she said. And to be ready for heaven is all that really matters in this life. It really is all. And when Amen. our loved ones breathe their life's breath just to know that they're ready. And she says uh, here, and there might be some that might not be real of interest, but I might not be able to skip over without seeing it. I am so happy that I got to see Jen. I had a wonderful visit. 
with him. He was so happy to see me. He sang, prayed, and quoted scripture with me. He is sorry for the way he led. I told him God had forgiven him and does not even remember his sins because they have been cast as far as the east is from the west and are covered by Jesus' blood. He prayed for his children that their names would be written in the Lamb's book of life and that they would meet him in heaven. He prayed for others also. He, uh, we had a good visit. He would forget a time, which, he is, which is very usual for a person in his circumstances. He did have cancer behind his eyes. Uh, yeah. I told him I would be back to, tomorrow that we are spending the night here in Columbia. I am so happy. I have had the opportunity to see him before he passes. He is looking forward to heaven. At times, he would kind of cry in a blessed type way. A number of times, he raised his arm, pointing up. Uh, then he mentioned somebody that didn't know the scene. But I just praise the God. He's had an up and down life and, and hasn't had the best disposition. But, and he realizes that and knows it, but he knew that he was ready for heaven. And it means worlds to me today just to know that he has made it. I love the Lord this morning for his love and his mercy. He's been so good to us, hasn't he? Yes, he has. I want to say one other thing. This little problem that I had in the last couple of months hasn't deterred me. I still mean what I said. <coughs> Whatever it takes to see our loved ones in, it's worth everything to go to heaven. And if I can be some help, some way, that's what I want to be. To get to a place that whatever it takes, take my houses, my lands, future my plans, gets us pretty low and him pretty high. Anyone else? Lindsay had taken time to create a schedule for specials. And so I knew that Brandon was supposed to play his saxophone this morning. And I felt like a certain song would be fitting and I asked him to, if they could sing it. And he bowed up on me and said no. But Heidi's gonna try to sing it and Brandon's gonna play his uh, saxophone this evening. So we're disrupting your list a little, Lindsay. Thank you for it, but he's gonna do it this evening. So Heidi, if you'll sing for us, please.
Does anybody remember where we were last week for a scripture lesson? Luke 10. Luke 10. The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. We talked about the man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho or Jericho to Jerusalem. Fell among thieves. A certain priest saw him. The Levite looked. The Samaritan had compassion. I hear that echo up here. Y'all hearing it too? And so last week we discussed loving thy neighbor. Jesus said, This do, and thou shalt live. And we, did, we talked about how the Samaritan, he, he poured of his oil and his wine, and he he gave of himself, and he gave of his expense, and he gave of his time, and he gave of his comfort. And he did all of those things. And we recognize we need to do all of those things. But can we do those things and have a heart that's cold without love? And I submit the answer is yes. We can go through the motions of being a good Samaritan, so to speak. And we can go through the motions of helping our fellow man and be cold without love in our hearts. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is where we're going to be this morning, I believe. And while you're turning, let me say, I probably should be sitting down there listening to somebody else preach this because I'm as guilty as anyone, guilty as anyone, to sometimes get caught in the trap of going through the motions and maybe not having Christ's love expressed in my heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. It rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether the, there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And dropping to verse 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these <coughs> is charity. Hey. Verse 1, Though I speak... <laughs> Though I speak, if I don't have charity, I'm become a sounding brass. How do we speak? Now, I'm not talking about the speaking that goes to the butcher and says, I'd like a pound of beef. Or the person at a uh, fast food joint says, would you like fries with that? Although even the simplest statement can said by the can that said by the inflection can give an underlying meaning. We were eating, I believe, at a Frisch's Big Boy uh, somewhere around Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the service was despicable. We waited and waited and waited for our food, and uh, it just, the service was bad. 
And so we got up and went to pay, and, and I had noticed the manager kind of watching a little bit, but she said, how was it? And I said, the food was good. And she was smart enough to pick up from that statement, the food was good, that maybe I meant the service wasn't. And she said, was everything good? And I said, no, it wasn't. Well, come to find out, the manager had just retired from the military recently. And I left there with the strong suspicion that things were fixing to happen and the server was fixing to learn what service meant. But she caught, just in a statement, the displeasure. She could hear from the inflection in my voice. We had gone, Heidi and I, I think it was before Ellie was born, to the Coffee Break Cafe one Friday night to eat. And it was, we, I think they closed at 7, and we must have gotten there about 6.30 or 10, or 10 to 6 or 6 o'clock, about an hour before they closed. And after we were there a little bit, the crowd thinned out. Nobody was there. And so the, the one server, the coffee break, wasn't very big, come out and started picking up chairs and putting them on the tables like they would do to close down. So... Our table, we had our seats, and every other table in the restaurant was shut down. All the chairs were up on the tables. Heidi said, doesn't make you feel very welcome, does it? And I said, no, not really. She said, are you going to say something? And I said, I believe I will. She said, let me out first. <laughs> so my dearly beloved had abandoned me. And I got up to pay, and the the menu, the takeout menu was laying there that had the hours on it. And I said, y'all close at seven, it's only 6.30, maybe 20 to seven by that point. I said, why are all the chairs up? I said, it doesn't make us feel very welcome. I said, we'll come back, we're not mad, but it doesn't make a person feel very welcome. I complained in a Christian way. I wasn't unkind or out of sorts, but in a business, you need to know this is how your customers feel. So it doesn't necessarily matter what's being said. It's how it's being said. But the Bible says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Sometimes I think this is specifically referring to when we're in a position or in a place like yesterday. The man said, is the pastor here? I wish that I thought to say, no, nope, haven't seen him. But instead, I said, well, that's me. And then we had a chat for quite a while and had to explain to him how your poor choices are leading in your poor consequences. And you're 54. You've got time to straighten it out. And it was interesting. But Jesus is concerned how we say stuff. What is our heart? Do we have love in our heart? Poor choices said the wrong way, can be heard, you stupid Egypt. If brains were powder, you couldn't blow your nose. Or poor choices said where it was filled from a heart of love could be heard, you made a mistake. Thankfully, you have a chance to do it over and get it right. The same statement can be heard two different ways based on the heart from which it's said. How's our speech this morning? Do we have a heart of love? Is it heard by people as having a heart of love? You see, we can't fake it. What's in your heart will come out as you're talking to people. You may fake it for a little bit, but pretty soon it'll come out. People will know whether or not you have charity or love in your heart. So that deals with our talking. The next verse is going to nail more people than that one. Because there are some Individuals, I think they're few and far between, that can keep their mouths shut. And verse 2 doesn't say a thing about talking. Help him, Lord. You all know what I'm speaking of. Some people just are naturally quiet. And so you don't really know what they're thinking. My dad is very quiet. I did not get my gift of gab from him. He's very quiet. 
But people that are quiet and are not talking or not ex- are not exposing themselves to criticism, they might fit here. Everyone in this church might fit here. Have the gifts of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and have all faith so that I can remove mountains. Now that takes a powerful a lot of faith to move a mountain. And have not charity, I am nothing. Nothing. Help him, Lord. Prophecy. If we think of Isaiah or Ezekiel or Joel or Samuel, and chapter 14 expands a little more about on it. But it is a gift that people even today can have. And to have that without love, nothing. To have understanding and wisdom, why wow, that's good. I like talking to people that understand and are wise. But if they don't have love, they're nothing. And faith? Why, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to be a Christian without faith. And so you've got all kinds of faith. And no love? Why, you're nothing. God knows our heart, how much love is in it. We may be the go-to prayer warrior, but do we have love in our heart? Our faith may have been instrumental in the salvation of souls or the sending of missionaries, the building of sanctuaries, but with no love, we're nothing. I said I needed to be the one to sit down there, and I'm going to tell you a story. And if you don't like me for it, keep listening. Was it back in November? We had an anointing service for Marky. And I truly believe God heard us that night. I'm shocked that we've not seen that prayer answered. I honestly am shocked. That was Sunday. Wednesday at Hercules, we anointed a little girl. It was Callie. On behalf of, it would be distantly related to her, a little boy who, how old was Nash? Little boy, Nash, had, if you look it up, it's H-U-S. You know, can you, you know what it stands for? Hemorrhagic nerve something syndrome. It's your kidneys are crashing and it hits you like a tsunami. If you can survive it, you'll live. If you don't, you're, it's over. But it'll, it's like total organ failure. And it can come from E. coli. Mother had it, and it was stemmed from ischemic colitis. But it's a, it's a disease that it, it affects your blood, and your kidneys will shut down. I mean, it's, you have to have plasma fluoresis to, be, to try to work through it. It's a mess. And so Nash had gotten the flu and got this HUS. <clears throat> Nash's mother and dad do not go to church. Nash's grandma and grandpa had gone to the Nazarene church in Bradleyville and then they'd quit, no longer went to church. His great grandparents would have never gone to church. His great great grandparents would have been the Nazarene pastor when we moved to Bradleyville in 89. Nash. We anointed Callie for Nash. And I'm not saying it was my prayers when we anointed her. I was the one that did it. That was gone. But almost immediately, they saw a turnaround in that little boy. Other people were praying for him too. God healed him. He's home, seemingly doing well. But my heart was, Lord, this family, they don't even go to church. They're backslidden, the ones that did. Why do you heal that kid and not the sister that goes to our church? And I'll confess, in my heart, I may not have had the right amount of love for a little guy that I've never met. God heard our prayer. He answered our prayer. I had faith, 
But am I nothing because I didn't have the love that I needed? This is tough preaching. It's been, it was tough getting it. It's tough giving it. God knows our heart. And so it doesn't matter how good we look or what we do. The church at Ephesus, he knew all about the good they had done, but they had lost their first love. And judgment was pronounced. I suspect if we needed to start naming names, we could name names of people we've known who were giants of the faith, pillars of the church, and seemingly had no love. How many churches have died because their saints had no love? How many denominations have folded house because no love? I was talking to a guy recently. They were getting a new pastor. The new pastor's Mid-30s, he and his wife have several children, four or five, six. I don't remember, several. And I asked this guy, I said, how many people's your church run? He said, oh, everybody's there, four or five. They live in a town, have a nice church, could be thriving. That denomination is known for not having. I know a guy who goes to a conservative holiness church in another state and he told me that the Baptists are nicer than the conservative holiness people. They have more love. Nothing. Does it get close to you or just to me? How much love do we have? Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, all of them, live a pauper myself, and give my body to be burned, self-sacrifice to the highest degree, and no love, Profiteth me nothing. God is concerned with what our heart is like. Amen. What our heart is like. Do we help somebody just to get rid of them? Take a 20 and skedaddle. Or because we love them? Why do we live self sacrificially? Is it for the praise from our fellow man? For return on investment from heaven? I think I've told the story of the guy before that told me he had got really aggravated over a tire problem. And so the company had given him four new tires when really he only needed one. And I asked him, do you know why? He said, the Lord really blessed me. And I said, do you know why? And he said, yeah, because I've been good to him. I said, no, so you can bless others. Well, that shut him up. He wasn't interested in that. I saw something this week. This guy walked up, walking along a sidewalk or in a mall or somewhere. Somebody was sitting on the curb crying. You all may have read it. Just sitting on the curb crying. And the guy had some compassion in his heart. He said, why are you crying? And the lady said, I've lost $200. I've lost $200. Well, the guy had some compassion on her, so he gave her $40. And his buddy said, why did you give that woman $40? He said, oh, he said, the Lord had blessed me. I found $200, and I just wanted to bless somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I just 
pass on a blessing, but do we love them? How long since we've helped somebody in any way from a heart full of love and not because of an obligatory feeling or response? A motive that's obligatory. Lord, examine my motives, Nathan's motives. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. To give for the wrong reason, God's not even going to recognize what we've done. It profited me nothing. And then we get into where the rubber meets the road. Charity suffers long and is kind. The aggravations keep coming. Kind. The children keep yelling. We're kind. The preacher preaches past 1145. We're kind. The neighbor keeps complaining. We're kind. The neighbor's dog keeps visiting. Kind. The realtor her and her client are whiners. Kind. That event, when we left, Heidi actually said, thank you for being kind to them. And all of it happens in one day. And we've had all these stresses and all these pressures and all these complaints and all these issues. And mama says, honey. And you are kind. Because charity suffers long and is kind. How about it? Are we kind? The same failures by the same individuals Time and time and time and time again. And we become unkind. We'll cut them down. We'll put them in their place. We'll give them a piece of our mind. I'll show them. No, the Bible says charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Are we happy for the good of others? He's stronger than I am. She's prettier than I am. They have more wealth than we do. He shot a bigger buck than I did. They caught more fish. Lori found more mushrooms. They're smarter. They have a bigger church. They got asked for the Saturday night service at the general camp. Are we happy for our brother? Amen. Do we envy? You say, no, I would never, I would never envy. Do we? God called me earlier this week. And he's, no, it was last week, I believe. I believe it was last, a week ago Friday. And he said, you know how you've always been after me to buy, become an owner in the place I work? And I said, yeah. He said, I have got a chance to buy 25% share of this company. And he said, the, uh, they're, they're selling it. The shares will be sold. It's an employee-owned type company. He said, the shares will be sold at a reduced rate for another, another employee. He said, I can buy 25% share for $600,000. <clears> well, so that put a $2.4 million valuation on the company. They've got over $5 million worth of inventory and real estate sitting there. It's a... No brainer, almost like sheep, Jack. It's a no brainer. <laughs> and so I I he said he was talking to me and he uh, I have always told him that capital will not be a problem to come up with. So I said, I'm gonna call the a guy I know that could loan you the six hundred thousand if if you need it. So I called him and talked to him and, and he said, This kind of decision is where fortunes are made. That's what the money means said. And I can stand before you and God and all the witnesses and say, I am happy for the man that called me with the potential to supersede anything I have ever done or probably hope to do. I'm happy for him. I'm not envious of him in the least. But are there times when we might be envious? Charity vaunteth 
not itself, is not puffed up. An old boy, he's a grown man now, but at the time he was just a late teenager. And he was at my brother's when Kevin was, well, it was the weekend my brother got married. And this boy was there. And Kevin was doing some, some minor remodel on his house. He was patching some vinyl siding, putting a piece or two in. It was real minor, but it was, it was a little something. And this boy decided he needed to be the boss and do it. He said, I've been working construction this summer, and I, I know how to do things. Well, he was kind of struck on himself with how much he had learned in a summer's worth of work. He was puffed up. A heart full of love doesn't puff up and think more of himself than he should. Are we full of ourselves? Are we like that dude on the Pirates Up in Tans? We want to sing our songs and do our dance and wear our top shit, little shiny pants? Pirates Up in Tans? No. It's a Ray Stevens song if you need to listen to it. <laughs> Verse 5, charity doesn't, be, doesn't behave unseemly. I know a guy, he was in his 60s when this happened, and he was at a car dealership and did not get his way regarding some repairs. And he told me, I threw a fit. Now, those of us that went to Golden Corral back in July, we saw unseemly behavior from a half-grown boy. I can only imagine, I know this guy, when he said through a fit, I know the kind of carnal, wicked individual he is. I would say it would have been one for the record books. I suspect he literally threw a child's temper tantrum and him a grown man. No matter the reason, no matter the place, if we've got love in our heart, we're going to behave. Amen. Seeketh not her own, unselfish. None of this sneak into the kitchen for the last piece of pie after the kids are asleep so you don't have to share. You see, that's kind of selfish. You'd say, no, that's really good parenting. So you don't have a fight to break up. But unselfish, not seeking your own. <coughs> Richard Ferguson always told my dad, if I've got a biscuit, you've got half. Not seeking his own, but another man's good. Not our desires, not our wants, not our pleasures or our way. See, we really, as far as God's concerned, have no claim to anything. Oh, our country says we have the right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And that's all well and good unless it's at the cost of others. Because the Bible says charity seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. We're named to hurry. I'm hardly half through. The guy that was here yesterday. I listened to his story. He told me his tale. And then I said, I'm going to go talk to the woman driving me. I want to see if it jives. If you're lying to me, I'm not going to be impressed. So I did. I went and talked to her. And believe it or not, he had lied to me a little. He had not told me all the truth. So he... Uh, he came back and he was ready to leave and I said, I will help you a little. But I said, you did lie to me. You know, he was easily provoked. And he kind of got all huffy and I'll take care of my own family, the man said. And I said, okay. I said, do you want help or not? Well, he kind of humbled himself down and took the help and 
I told him, I said, we have church at 945 in the morning if you want to come back. I said, poor choices have poor consequences, whether you're 6, 16, or 60. Amen. And we dealt, I dealt with him. I may never see him again. But I told him, in Christian love, we love you. And Jesus loves you. And to get your heart right with God, it won't be a get out of jail free card. There's still consequences for your action, but it'll change the path you're on. Amen. And so we say charity's not easily provoked. Well, what about you? Can somebody push your buttons? Do they know where you keep your goat tied? If your buttons can get pushed very easy, you may need a spiritual checkup. Do I have love in my heart? Charity thinketh no evil. A heart full of love doesn't want any evil to befall another. I got so upset at Mark Braden at the cabinet shop. We had worked together so long we were like brothers. I knew what he was thinking. He knew what I was thinking. We could get a lot of stuff done. We worked well together. But that day I was aggravated at him for something. And the last thing I said as I walked out the door that day, he had three cows or three head of cattle. I said, I hope all your cattle are out and left. <laughs> I was headed to do my own chores is where I was leaving. So I went to the house and got stuff ready. And I had rented 400 acres north of Bradleyville and so I was on the way over there and I passed Keith and Rhonda Cook's place and there was three cattle out in that, their field. I thought, man, those look familiar. Went on down to my place and I was three short. <laughs> I don't know if it was the Lord trying to get my attention or what. He had three cattle and realistically, I would cursed him. Said, I hope yours are out. Well, guess who got the cattle that were out? So then I had all the aggravation. Had to go get a trailer, catch cattle, load them. It was a mess. Love thinketh no evil. Little Jimmy Dickens didn't have a heart full of love when he said, may the bird of paradise fly up your nose. May an elephant caress you with his toes. May your wife be plagued with runners in her hose. That's not a heart full of love. <laughs> Is it? Anybody else besides me guilty of maybe having that attitude? God help us. You know, some of this is good enough preaching. I ought to sit down and amen myself. Help us, Lord. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. This almost makes me think of participation trophies. Many a person, sometimes I visualize a grandma who may take pleasure and rejoice in what was done through sin. An example might be a baby that was conceived out of wedlock. You say, this is going to get tough. Yeah, it is. Because you've got to love the mother, and you've got to love the baby, but you really can't be saying, congratulations on having a baby. You've got to draw a fine line between, am I rejoicing in the sin? Or am I rejoicing in, in a person that God allowed to be created? You see, there's rejoicing when great-grandchildren are coming to the world that they haven't been able to have children, and, and suddenly we're going to get them. That brings rejoicing. Love doesn't gloss over wrong. Love still knows right from wrong. Does not rejoice in iniquity. Just because we have a loving heart and are full of God's love doesn't make us squishy and malleable and, and eliminate absolutes. There is a tough love. A love that says no. A love that punishes. A love that abstains. But love must always be in harmony with truth. Amen. Pilate said, what is truth? My word is truth. Love must always be in harmony with God's word. Okay. Verse 7, it beareth all things, 
Pleasant, unpleasant, it bears it. Easy, hard, happy, sad, good, bad. Love doesn't qu quit, just keeps going. Nothing. Beareth all things. Beareth all things. And if we're going to, I wrote, I'll, I'm just going to write it, or re, say it the way I wrote it down. Let me say here, if we're going to love kids, bear with them through church. Bear with them through church. I asked Connor this morning, can you stay for church? He wishy washy around, and I said, the correct answer is yes. And obviously, he chose to go. But we've got to break that habit. If we get children here, they need to stay for preaching. I can preach over them. I've got four there we do. God can give us things to say, to help, to keep their attention. And if we're going to start having children and we're going to talk vacation Bible school in a while, and if we're praying for kids to come in, why have them come in to ship them out? If we're going to have love in our heart, we're going to have to bear with them and endure some things. Are we men or are we mice? That's not in my notes. We were all children once, and most of us had the privilege of having good parents that sat with us and endured us and, and disciplined us. But the world is full of people who don't have that privilege. Sin has wrecked havoc. And God put us here on West New Hope Road to make a difference. Not just to put in our time, but to make a difference. Shame on us if our love won't bear a little noise and aggravation and distraction. If we love people, we're going to have to bear. The Bible says it believeth all things. This is part that I struggle with. Because I want to trust but verify. And so I'll confess, I don't totally know and understand how to believe all things. I think it has to be taken with the next phrase, hope with all things. You see, Paul and Barnabas, they reached the point, Barnabas hoped for John Mark. Paul didn't necessarily believe. But there came a time when Paul saw what John Mark had become. Believe and hope. We've got to hurry. I'll pass over that. Verse 7 continues. It endureth all things. Love endures. I tried to count up last night. I think there is somewhere over 325 years of marriage represented here this morning. That's a lot of enduring. You know, some days... Mama deserves a baseball bat and not a dozen roses, but still love endures. It endures. Good times and bad times, it endures. We think nothing about loving a spouse for decades, and yet we struggle to love our neighbor for a few hours, or even a few days, or months. Jesus said, love him! Period. He didn't put a time limit on it. Amen. It's going to have to endure if we've got it. Yeah. It's not going to fail. Everything else might and will. Prophecies, tongues, knowledge. But charity won't fail. You yeah. say, why not? Why won't charity fail? It's from the very heart of God. And God yeah. is. He's not going to fail. Love is God imparted in us. Beloved, love us, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's how come it won't fail. It's from the very heart and nature of God. It's a command that we love. 
we've got a pretty good standard for what love is and how it acts and does. So I would have to ask this morning, are we full of God's love? Is there any part of us that we speak with the tongues of men and don't have charity? We're racket. We have gifts of prophecy, understand wisdom and have knowledge and faith. No charity, we're nothing. And though we give and though we're self-sacrificing and have not charity, it profits nothing. Do we suffer long and remain kind? Do we envy not? Are we puffed up? Do we behave unseemly? Do we seek our own? Love isn't easily provoked. It thinketh no evil. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Amen. We can go through the motions and fail miserably. Or we can be like the songwriter said, I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love, till there's just no more love. I could never, never out-love the Lord. We can't. He's commanded it. We've got the pattern. Let's do it. Yes. Let's do it. Let's stand. <clears throat> Marky, dismiss us, please.